It's excellent to be here today, and I, I appreciate the uh, invitation, so I'll, I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, I am from uh, Austin and UT, but I will say that my money comes here to, to Aggieland. Um, my daughter and uh, two of my nephews and nieces go here. My wife graduated from A&M, and my older son did too. So I've been here many times, but mostly as a, a participant of the great activities that you have here on campus. So I'm glad to be here to give a, a lecture. Um, so the title of my talk is about physical activity, fitness, uh, academic achievement, and public policy. So I'm going to try and cover all of those things in, in an hour or so. This is my friend Harold's daughter, uh, Haley. And I put Haley on the front of this j just because I, I like to think that she represents our, our future. We're in a, a, a park, Zilker Park in, in Austin. And part of the work I'm going to talk to you about today is, is designed to, to help her develop her capacity, develop her mental capacity. That's why I put the brain up there. Um, and so we're going to review the literature on uh, what the relationships are, how strong they are, and how consistent that literature is. So maybe we can start thinking about whether or not uh, physical activity, physical fitness is uh, causally related to improvements in academic achievement and in, in cognition in general. So I want to I talk about that literature and then end up with uh, whether or not this could be considered uh, uh, enough evidence to take action in the public policy arena. Uh, before I do so, I want to let you know that uh, in Austin, uh, my wife and I, she's the co-director, that's uh, Deanna Helscher, um, uh, we're hosting a, a major international conference on May 23rd through 26th. It's the International Society for Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity in Austin. And uh, I've been to many of these conferences and all over in different parts of the world. So for those of you who have an interest and, and want to visit Austin in, in a month or so. This conference is coming up and we, we welcome you to come. There's still room to, to register. Um, so in 2008, uh, the, the Department of Health and Human Services and the CDC put out the 2008 Physical Activity Guidelines. So I just want to start here because uh, when I go and speak to schools and superintendents and probably all of you in kinesiology have seen this report or been assigned this report or understand that that exists, but for kids, and, and the report covers you know, all ages and all different sort of relations between physical activity and health outcomes. So uh, the recommendations are for children that are 60 minutes or more of physical activity per day. Uh, if you're obese, uh, you are in the more category. So at 60 minutes or more, people forget the, the more part. So 60 minutes is really considered a minimum amount of physical activity. It's divided into these three different categories to optimize your health. So uh, if you have other health conditions, you might want to think about it as the more part. So that, that'll be an important number to remember, uh, 60 minutes per day, because we uh, can create environments and situations in schools so where kids can get 60 minutes at school. So the, the question really is how can we create an environment so that kids will get 60 minutes per day or feel encouraged enough to do it. And if they do so, they will uh, get the uh, health benefits that are related to physical activity and also the uh, academic achievement and cognitive benefits I'm going to talk mostly about in a minute. So. Where does the healthy mind come from? What we're talking about is trying to uh, recognize the connection between uh, physical activity and academic performance and then understand, uh, or I hope I can help you understand, why schools are an ideal place uh, for children to uh, uh, become uh, active and to uh, participate in physical activity. And hopefully they'll participate in a way that'll get them to understand that uh, physical activity is good, it's fun, and you can participate in it throughout your entire lifespan. Um, and then we'll talk about new programs and policies. So why is this question important? And it wasn't too long ago, and the previous speaker talked about the UIL and the sort of the historical roots of physical activity as, as a value. Um, and uh, you know, our, our national debate changes uh, over time as we think about how to educate children properly and as we implement uh, testing standards to see if schools are delivering the, the right combination of educational opportunities so that they meet minimum standards. Um, so that uh, physical activity is, is being uh, in many ways downplayed to a certain extent as an academic endeavor in the first place. So I like to talk to different audiences and say, well, why is it that physical activity is important and why are schools important? And uh, you know, firstly, they're important because uh, 
They're crucial to public health efforts such as physical activity at school. Most schools have a, a PE program, uh, so they have some infrastructure and they have uh, coaches and, and other staff and, and the UIL and other organizations which are very willing and able to deliver uh, either in school or after school or other sorts of activities. Um, but they're also very important as a means to uh, do surveillance. And by surveillance, I just mean um, public health statistics are, are are dependent on uh, going out and, and collecting information from people so we can see you know, where we are today, where we were in the past, and so we can make projections and, and plans for how to deal with the future if we uncover public health problems. So most, most, most children are in school, at least uh, from kindergarten through about 10th grade. You can, you can get about 90% uh, of the kids uh, at school. So schools are evaluated and funded based on academic test results. We heard that in the previous lecture too. There's, uh, 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 they're evaluated in the sense that those numbers that uh, are published in the summer every year, that's whether you're in the academic acceptable uh, or unacceptable category as a percentage of the students that pass the test in meeting and, uh, and reading and mathematics, et cetera, um, very much are, are on the minds of the local community as they compare schools. Uh, parents want to know where the best schools are because they want to send their kids there. School districts are rated. Um, and uh, it's, it's an important endeavor the way we uh, go about uh, doing this testing and, and allocate uh, scarce resources. Um, so schools are necessarily interested in how to increase their performance and they can do that by training teachers to do you know, better jobs at teaching math. There might be new math programs or new curriculum or more efficient ways of doing business. Uh, but I'll submit through this lecture that there are ways to think that physical activity can be as important and perhaps more important than some of the strategies that schools and school districts are, are employing uh, right now to improve their scores. Um, in fact, that's a little quote from the, a friend of mine who's on the AI Austin Independent School District uh, School Board. Um, they're always interested in learning more. So I want to talk just a little bit about uh, Texas, and, and some of you might know this, and, but uh, uh, these are the uh, districts in Texas, the regions, uh, 1 through 20, and the percentage that are classified as uh, economically disadvantaged. And that, that almost overlaps with free and reduced lunch. Probably all of you remember free and reduced lunch. I just want to say that one of the most important predictors of physical activity and academic achievement are and is uh, where, the, where you come from. So you can see uh, in Region 1 in Edinburgh, we've got 86% of the kids down along the border in Region 1 are in environments that has, have fewer resources than more resources. So all I'm saying in, in pointing this out is when we consider not only just interpreting the data that we receive, but the strategies that we might employ, we have to take into account that not every district has the capacity to take up all the recommendations that we might, we might make. And we have to customize some of the recommendations that we would make because of that. Um, when we look at the children who are, are fit, also by educational regions, the 20 regions throughout the state. And you probably know that, uh, I think it was six years ago or so, uh, the state required that uh, children uh, from grades 3 through 12 engage in the uh, fitness gram testing procedure. So if you look at that data, and uh, you know, the fitness gram testing procedure has, uh, I think it's seven different uh, components of fitness that, that are measured. Um, these are the ones who are failing the, the uh, cardiovascular fitness test. So it's either the one mile run or a 20 meter shuttle run. And for those of you, probably all of you in kinesiology know that that's related to oxygen uptake, VO2 max. So uh, here we've got uh, some, you know, between, um, oh, what's the low? 38% uh, up to 52% are failing that fitness test. So when uh, I make the case that uh, improvements in fitness are correlated both uh, cross-sectionally and uh, predictive longitudinally and experimentally derived uh, based on you know, real experiments that fitness improvements lead to impor important uh, improvements in cognition and academic achievement. We've got a lot of kids who are not fit in this state. We've got a lot of work to do is what this says to me. Um, and then, of course, uh, physical activity is half the battle in any discussion about obesity in uh, this state or any region because the other half is uh, dietary intake. So uh, here we can see the uh, percentage of children who are obese in our state as measured by the fitness gram test. And, and uh, I would say that that's, that's probably too high um, and that there again we have a lot of work to do because it, um, obesity in and of itself is going to be an inhibitor to becoming physically fit. 
And the big you are, the less likely you are to desire to be, you know, to, to move. And when, when you get really big, it becomes even more difficult and challenging. You need more, you know, specialized sort of treatment and, and understanding about how to go out becoming and getting fit all over again. So I think the benefits of a physically active child, and, and this is what I'm going to summarize in the front rather than at the end, uh, student test scores improve after engaging in physical activity. If, if I had uh, each of you run in place for 15 minutes right now and then gave you a test, you would probably do better than uh, same class of uh, different people or even the same people uh, without that 15 minutes of physical activity. So there's the right now effect of physical activity, the acute dose of physical activity. And we can argue about whether it's five minutes or 10 minutes or 20 minutes, um, but there is research that shows that students that uh, engage in physical activity are, are more alert um, immediately after and following the physical activity. Students who are physically active are more likely to achieve in school than their sedentary peers. And here we're talking about chronic and routine physical activity on a daily basis or an every other day basis. Um, and that will, you know, if it's vigorous enough, will accumulate into improvements in fitness uh, so that uh, kids who are, are, are more fit are more academically able, or at least they, they test better on scores. Um, and that academic achievement can improve with physical activity even when you take time out of the day from pursuing other academics. And, and that's a very important finding. There, there's not a lot of literature on this, but, but enough to say that if you've got uh, six hours per day to, to work with kids, and that, that's the hours you've got, and you have to fill that time to achieve your, your minimum values for academic achievement or it, uh, motivate kids to hit the maximum value and become gifted, um, you have to allocate the time. So, there's research that says if you take some of that time away and devote it to physical activity, you won't see a reduction in test scores. So that, that's very important too for the administrators as they're deciding what they're going to do. So I want to talk a little bit about epidemiology and how we go about doing our business. I have a PhD in epidemiology. I also have a master's degree in uh, health education. Um, and there's a guy named uh, Sir Bradford Hill. And if you go back to uh, 1965, he established what we call the, uh, the Hill postulates of ca or causal criteria. There's different sort of names for them. And this is Bradford Hill right here. And what we're trying to do is to come up with a scientific rationale of how we can classify information and decide whether A causes B. It's not always obvious to do. Um, it, it's more obvious if we were in a lab and we had complete control over the independent variable, whatever the exposure is, and the outcome, and we can measure it very precisely. You can do that you know, pretty well in the natural sciences. You can do it you know, reasonably well in the biological sciences, but in human beings, it's more difficult to, to establish that. And it's even more difficult if you think about you know, long periods of time uh, for exposure. In this case, we're talking about cigarette smoking. So these Bradford Hill criteria were used in the 1964 Surgeon General Report, uh, which really sort of uh, uh, spurred the movement, the anti-smoking movement in the United States. Back in the, the 50s and 60s, probably the smoking rate was anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of men and women in this country. Uh, and uh, that's partly because people didn't understand that smoking was harmful to them. But to understand that, we had to have credible scientific evidence that, that it was true. So, in doing that, we have these six different causal criteria. I'm going to talk just a little bit about them because that's how I'm going to try and approach this talk about physical activity, fitness, and academic achievement. And uh, it's always fun to put up this very old advertisement, and uh, that's uh, from the 30s. Um, where most doctors talked about uh, Lucky Strikes being less irritating. And I'm, I'm old enough to remember Lucky Strikes with the round circle on the front. And uh, what you're not seeing on there is a filter on that cigarette, which if any of you have ever smoked an unfiltered cigarette, no, it's, it's pretty irritating. <laughs> anyway, um, so Hill's postulates. We, we talk about from, from epidemiological evidence, what's the strength of the association? That can either be an odds ratio or, or some other number, a correlation coefficient and such. So, but in general, all things being equal, if the association is strong, we have more confidence that it might be a causal relationship. So uh, that's an important point. So, you know, in the case of uh, smoking and lung cancer, uh, people who smoke have 17 times the greater risk of developing lung cancer than people who don't smoke. If you smoke in an asbestos plant, you have a 178 times more chance of becoming uh, a lung cancer 
So that strength of the association is meaningful. Usually we start gauging a strong association being a doubling of risk or so, but a you know, three-fold risk or five-fold or ten-fold risk you know, clearly is, is stronger in that it might uh, be causal. So we also think about biologic gradient or a dose response. So that at each increase in the level of exposure, we say a higher risk for the disease, that tells us that there might be you know, a causal relationship. And in smoking, we see that very same thing. In fact, uh, uh, there, there's no real safe level of smoking, but if you smoked one cigarette per day, uh, your risk of uh, heart disease or lung cancer is actually pretty low. If you increase it to 2, to 5, to 10, to 30, uh, then your chances go up. Some people smoke 5 or 6 packs of cigarettes per day and their risk just gets much, much bigger. So that's, that's evidence that you know, the more you do of something, the more chances are that something uh, harmful is going to happen to your health. Another uh, criterion that we use is uh, consistency. So when we see in different studies in different parts of the world using different measurement techniques with young kids, old kids, old kids, <laughs> older adults, um, uh, different people uh, from different ethnic ethnicities or racial social classes, if you, if you see a consistent relationship, you have more confidence that the relationship is real. Uh, temporality is an important one. It goes to the, the logical models from going all the way back to, to Galileo that the cause must precede the effect unless we live in a, a quantum universe where they happen at the same time. But uh, that was a joke. <laughs> my, my, my kids don't understand it either. Anyway, so temporality, the, the event, the exposure has to happen before the disease or the de disease process occurs. And, you know, depending on the type of study that you use, that can be a challenging thing to do. You know, much of the research we do is cross-sectional, where we give, I could give a survey to all of you, and I could divide the class up to people that smoke and don't smoke, or are highly physically active versus low physically active. And that same survey could measure whether you, you know, have bronchitis or some other thing. Um, but that happens at a moment in time, and I can't say in that one particular survey which came first, your being physically active or your academic achievement. So you, you get tangled up in the temporality of things, and different studies allow you to uh, 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 assess which came first. Um, and then biologic plausibility. It's, does it make sense? What do we know about the biology of things? What do we know exactly what happens when I smoke a cigarette and that the fumes go into my lungs and it gets uh, through the, the air sacs and gets distributed throughout the bloodstream? How possibly could that cause lung cancer? How possibly could that cause cardiovascular disease? So we, we look at what's known in the biological world at the, uh, you know, the cellular level or even further down at the DNA level uh, and then up into the, the, you know, the major systems uh, and, and try and figure that out. So if we have evidence that says something causes something but it's completely in disagreement with the known biology, then that would reduce our, our, our thinking about it. Um, and then the experimental sort of uh, uh, type of experiment or research that you can do that uh, means that you can manipulate the exposure. If I could randomly select each of you and make you smoke for 15 years versus people that don't, and I would randomly select that you don't smoke and then wait and see what happens, probably more people would die of lung cancer. And that's why experiments in the health field are, are challenging at times because you know, it's unethical to, to do such experiments as I just described. But you can do all sorts of other experiments to establish uh, causality. When, when you have direct control over the exposure, uh, and can precisely measure the outcome, that gives you a, a very strong basis to assess causality. So in the field of epidemiology, what we would do before we would say that A causes B, we would do a literature search and try and hunt down all the information that's available within each of these six categories and start making a judgment call as to whether the information is enough to say that A causes B. So if you were students in my class, you'd have to, be, you'd have to memorize that. But you're not, so that's okay. Uh, so biologic plausibility. What do we know about uh, physical activity, physical fitness, and uh, any potential you know, biologic pathways that would help us understand why we think fitness would be related to academic achievement? Well, we have experiments that show that people are f that exercise um, immediately post-exercise uh, will increase intention and working memory skills. We know that people who habitually exercise have a higher levels of self-esteem and uh, self-confidence. It improves your mood. It can reduce your stress. 
And those things can uh, either inhibit or accelerate your ability to understand something. Uh, it delivers oxygen-rich blood, which uh, nourishes the brain. So it helps uh, ward off fatigue in the brain. Um, so it has you know, direct relationships there. It can stimulate growth and greater connections between the nerve cells. And that, that's been done in uh, you know, the neurobiology of uh, fitness and physical activity. It's a, it's, it's a growing field. Um, it strengthens connections between the left and right hemisphere, between the logical part of the brain to the more abstract part of the brain. There's been ex experiments uh, working on that. And it can also help control blood sugar. And uh, you know, ear regulation or lack of control of blood sugar is also associated with cognitive function uh, as well. So if you're obese or diabetic or pre-diabetic, physical activity can, uh, can help you uh, in cognitive performance. So, you know, when we think about the biology of things, and this is just a glucose control circuits, and you know, I can't give a lecture on, on how this all works, but just to say that there's a lot of sort of complicated biology underneath how the, how the body works. So what you find is uh, research that, that uh, discusses each one of these connections, um, and, and I just use this because uh, it's in the area of uh, glucose control, because it, it is a very important thing as the rate of diabetes increases and climbs actually to rather high levels in part because of lack of physical activity and increases in uh, obesity. Um, but there's a fair bit of literature about this idea of glucose control and uh, you can see how it, it potentially could be related to uh, muscles and the way our physiology works, uh, which could then be related to cognitive performance. And I found this study uh, recently that it looks at the effects of exercise therapy in the treatment of chronic diseases, a meta-analysis. And if you're not familiar with the sort of hierarchy of, of evidence that uh, we as scientists use, um, in the previous uh, causal criteria, we're talking about lots and lots of papers. That 1964 Surgeon General report probably had 50,000 different papers inside of the recommendation that finally said that smoking does cause cancer. It is time for us to do something about this because we know it's causal. And we know it because we classified those 50,000 papers, which by the way are now up to about 250,000 papers if smoking's not good for you. Same thing is underneath a, a thing like this. We, we look at a meta-analysis, a collection of studies where you very precisely quantify the effects of things um, from many, many different studies. So in this case, I don't want to necessarily talk about all the different subcomponents, but just to say we've got physical activity in and death down in the corner here. So there's a lot of processes that go on in between. Many different ways with which in the biological world that one could uh, either prove or imagine that uh, physical activity would be related to uh, cognition and uh, in the treatment of uh, disease. So here we have in 2010 a very important report that the uh, Centers for Disease Control put out um, and the uh, Division of Adolescent and School Health. So they collected uh, all the papers they could find, all the, you know, the peer-reviewed research papers, and, and looked at the relationship between physical activity, fitness, and academic performance outcomes. Uh, I think they found about uh, 260 or so studies, which they examined and made it into that report. And you know, when a report comes out in 2010, that means it covers the literature. Oops, a phone call. Good thing it's on hold. Um, it's annoying. Um, so anyway, basically what they said in there is that physical activity improves academic achievement, including uh, grades at school and uh, standardized test scores. And they also concluded in this report that physical activity impacts cognitive skills, uh, including enhanced concentration, attention, and improved classroom behavior. You know, that's a big category, classroom behavior. Think about the kids that are a little bit uh, squirrely in class uh, and, and ways to calm them down a little bit and to focus them. And it also, incre the increasing physical education time does not reduce academic performance. I made that point already. So if you're really interested in this topic, I'd recommend you just go online, grab the PDF of this whole report and have a look at it. It covered the field since 2010. <coughs> One of the reasons why there's a, a, a great deal of uh, um, interest in this topic is because not too long ago, we didn't know the precise mechanisms. So we didn't know the uh, statistical relationships or the associations between fitness, physical activity, and academic performance and cognition. So that when the uh, No Child Left Behind was put into place, which is about 10 years ago, maybe even more, 
um, and the state standards were put into place throughout the entire country uh, and schools were then being uh, graded mostly basically by the percent of kids that, that met standard um, there was a movement to eliminate the time for physical activity in schools uh, and rightly so to a certain extent because school superintendents and school board members and teachers are being judged by how many kids meet the standard which didn't exist before so they're looking at you know a variety of different ways to to meet those objectives and uh, physical activity was being um, cut back or cut out in some cases. I know of some schools that eliminated recess, for example, for, for elementary school kids, which sounds sort of like a, a pretty harsh punishment <laughs> if you have little kids. But, uh, but anyway, so the, the research started accumulating and, and people like me, I'd meet with superintendents and school boards and teachers you know, all the time, that, that's what I do. So they want to know what that evidence is and that's partly why I'm here today explaining to you because I've been thinking and uh, participating in this evidence myself. Uh, but this report was a nice one because it, uh, they did a really good job of accumulating the literature. But we're really on a, a, a fast track now of really understanding how this works. Uh, there's a lot more research that's been going on since 2010. So I'm um, just going to review, show you a couple of new articles that have come out. You can look them up on your own. But uh, this one um, in, is a review article in 2011. I just say yes. But yes, they've confirmed once again in a slightly different category of a review of the literature where they're looking at chronic and acute physical activity participation on neuroelectric measurements of brain health and cognition during childhood. And their, their main conclusion uh, on summarizing the literature in doing this is that physical activity influences the integrity and flexibility in which attentional resources, the way you pay attention to things, are administered within the external world and to the extent in which individuals monitor and adjust their actions in response to external demands. I mean, that, that's a little bit hard to follow, but that, that, that's the, the, the main conclusion to this by uh, Charles Hillman, who's a, a, a noted uh, a kinesiologist at uh, University of Illinois in Champaign um, in doing this kind of research. So he's written a number of the instrumental papers uh, in this topic area. He, he focuses largely in movement and cognition. Here he's done this review and the answer is yet again yes. So these are updates from the 2010. Here's another meta-analysis and again meta-analysis is something as a few steps uh, of higher sophistication from a, a systematic review or just looking at a review article or any individual article. It's, it's a statistical procedure to look at uh, quantifying the effects from many different studies into a, a single number. So here this particular one is looking at the effects of physical activity and fitness on achievement and cognitive outcomes. Again, a meta-analysis. The present studies show that physical activity has a significantly positive impact on children's cognitive outcomes and academic achievement and that the standardized effect size, the overall magnitude of it is 0.28. Now, if, you, if you're not familiar with standardized effect sizes, uh, the, the short little story on it is, uh, remember the bell-shaped curve, there's a mean, there's a standard deviation. So these effect sizes largely, and people do them slightly differently, but uh, they, they, they mean a percentage of the standard deviation. If you have a, a treatment or an intervention and you can move a group of people in your intervention group a whole standard deviation, that's considered a very big effect size. So it hardly ever happens. You know, so you, it's, it's a way to talk about the size of an effect. And remember, we're looking at the strength of the association, one of our causal criteria. It's a way of talking about the size of an effect. So here we see a 0.28, which is generally you know, considered a, a, a medium effect size. It's not a huge whopping effect size, but it, it, it's there, it's significant, it's seen across a number of different studies, and it increases to uh, 0.32, which is much a little bit bigger uh, when we look at experimental versus cross-sectional studies. So this, this particular meta-analysis is pointing out there's, a, there's at least a medium and real effect size. Now, this is data from California. Uh, California was the first state which started doing the uh, Ken Cooper from Dallas, uh, the fitness gram measure. And I've used this slide over and over again to, to just talk about it. So if you think about those, those different, uh, uh, in this case there's six different tests of fitness. So it's a cardiovascular fitness, it's uh, push-ups, it's uh, pull-ups, it's uh, uh, flexibility, um, and sit-ups. So it's a little bit of core strength, a little bit of upper body strength, uh, and then uh, running in aerobic too. So these are the kids that can only pass one of those six tests. Uh, and this is their achievement scores uh, 
their achievement scores on the Stanford Achievement Test. So you can see the percentage of kids that passed in both the, uh, either the reading or the mathematics is uh, much lower than those that were passing all six of those tests. And this is uh, pertaining to uh, the strength of the effect and the first criteria that I mentioned, because here we're seeing 26 up to 60, a doubling of the effect size. And remember, uh, anywhere around two times of an effect uh, is usually what we start thinking of as a, a meaningful and interpretable difference when you're talking about two different exposures in its relationship to a disease. But we also see a dose response, or what I previously called the uh, biological gradient, so that the, the more fitness you have based on passing two of the six, three of the six, four of the six, five of the six, the relationship increases each time. That's a, a fairly strong pattern of data. Um, although it's still correlational, so we have not figured out the temporality issue. So you can, you can scientifically criticize this if you want to, yet still we have a striking finding in the strength of the association category. Uh, we've also got a striking finding in the dose response category, two of those six categories that we're interested in to, to help us understand if uh, something causes another thing. So, uh, and I should say that this is, you know, there's probably about 300,000 kids in here. So it's not just a, a small sample of kids, it's a very robust sample uh, population level. Here again, um, the, the, the group up in uh, Cooper uh, did what they call the Texas Youth Fitness Study and they use uh, the data that uh, comes from uh, uh, fitness gram in the measurement from grades 3 through 12. Uh, and here again, we, we just, they simply looked in 2009 uh, of the schools that are classified as exemplary, recognized, acceptable, and unacceptable. I should say that the schools are in this unacceptable category. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, if you score unacceptable for several years in a row, they're going to decommission the school. So that, that's, this is high stakes poker that we're talking about. If you fall in that unacceptable category, things bad are going to happen. Uh, the principal will get fired. I've seen schools that the entire teaching staff will get fired. The, they'll let go of the whole school, they'll rename the school, and then reopen the school with a whole new staff. It's a very expensive process. Uh, people get all emotional about the schools and such. But here, if we just classify them across the state of Texas, um, we're seeing a, a rather high rate of, uh, of passing of the fitness test uh, if you're exemplary and then it goes down in a dose response fashion down to 40 percent. So that's 40 percent into 80 percent. That's about a doubling risk factor from the top to the bottom which is a meaningful sort of effect size and another dose response. So we're seeing you know almost the same thing as they saw in California. In this case it's millions of kids uh, in this slide because it's the whole state of Texas and there's about three million kids or so. Uh, in Texas. And they went further with this study and looked at the relationship between the cardiovascular fitness, which is the aerobic type of a fitness, uh, and whether it was associated with better academic performance, and uh, saw a 0.54 correlation coefficient between kids who passed the fitness test um, and their academic achievement in, ta in the, the previous uh, standardized test for Texas, the tax test. Uh, and then we found a, a, a much smaller uh, 0.30 relationship between children who are obese and their, their passing of the test. So a 0.54 is actually a pretty big correlation coefficient. There, in this, this field that in, it has physical activity um, and in uh, academic measures, it, it's reasonably uh, robust. So one would interpret that as a, a, a medium to large effect size at 0.54. So I became curious about this uh, a while ago, and I have friends since I live in Austin, in the uh, Austin Independent School District. So they've been using Fitness Gram for a number of years before it was even mandated, and uh, we're seeing basically the same slide. So th this is uh, um, individual level children uh, where we are examining, you know, a kid's level of fitness and their academic achievement. Again, in uh, mathematics and reading the testing, and here we see a dose response effect. Uh, and uh, you know, a reasonably large effect too. So it's about a 10 to 15 percent difference. So nowadays when I go to see a superintendent and I say, what are you doing? How much would you spend? How much would you organize amongst your teaching staff if I could tell you I could give you a 10 or 15 percent, percent boost in your academic achievement scores? Would that take you from the unacceptable into the acceptable category? Is, is that enough? And we're starting to get some traction where, where the answers to that are, are yes. In fact, I'm meeting with, uh, I just met last week with the uh, superintendent of Hayes uh, School District, 
And, uh, you know, if you know uh, that, that part, you know, just south of uh, Austin, it just seemed like it grew up overnight. Now there's all the shopping and, and everything along 35 on both sides. So the land developers didn't put in many parks. It's, it's very unusual. For, for whatever reason, they grew so fast that uh, I'm going to meet with the superintendent and the major land developers in that area so that they can work harder in installing public parks so that there's a place for kids to play. So this came from the superintendent who heard about the work that we do in Austin um, and this work in general and wants me to come and talk to people that, that control the resources. So that's where things can end up when you do work like this. It's kind of interesting. This is also from Austin ISD and the superintendents are, are highly interested in the number of kids who are in school on any given day because they count up how many kids are at school and they, they get reimbursed. That's how schools arrive at their funding is the, the, the number of kids who are present at school. So here we can fee see that uh, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, they, they pass none of the fitness, they're absent 14 days and it goes down to eight. So, you know, it's almost a doubling of the size of the effect uh, that we're seeing uh, in several different ways that we measure it with different, different uh, numbers. And it, it's uh, almost a dose response effect. It flattens out a little bit down here, but clearly there, there's, there's some level of difference as you increase your fitness level in the absenteeism rate. And uh, just one percentage point in absenteeism can mean a great deal to a district of, of any size. So we're not talking about pocket change. It's, it's a lot of money that they're leaving on the table um, that would, I guess, would uh, clearly pay for improvements in the physical activity program, a 1% increase. If you could take kids from not being fit to fit, um, that would be a, a dramatic increase in funding to the school district. That's sort of a backwards way of thinking, but it makes sense and it's logical, and I think schools are starting to pay attention to it. Tomorrow, you're going to have John Rady come and talk to you, and he's done some, some of the most incredible work in, in the whole country about getting school districts to buy into fitness. And I'll bet you, because I've seen him speak and I've read his book, he's going to present numbers from uh, Naperville, Illinois, which has fully embraced this fitness, where most of the kids are fit, and they're down here and passing all of the tests, and he will show you academic achievement scores and other sort of uh, cognitive performance measures that they've been able to do. Uh, I wish I was here tomorrow to, to hear him speak. He's a great speaker. This is a paper that uh, I did with a student of mine, Duncan Van Dusen, uh, where we, we looked at about 400,000 records uh, in the state of Texas and their fitness gram scores and just did a little bit further dissection of that data to help us understand where the, the biggest amount of benefit comes from. And this is a different score. Um, where we, we're looking at the cardiovascular fitness measure. I'm sorry, we're looking at all the different measures. We've got the, the cardio and the curl-ups, the push-ups, the sit and reach, and the trunk lift. Um, and uh, we're looking at those that score in the top quintile. If you take the distribution of scores in, in uh, academic achievement and divide into five equal piles, those are quintiles. So we're looking at the, those that scored the highest in the top quintile, quintile five, and subtract um, those that are in the lowest, quintile one. And the difference is what you see here. So here you see the biggest difference, um, and these are boys and girls, uh, is in the cardiovascular fitness area, followed you know, closely by the curl-ups. And uh, you know, probably, uh, if you're going to design a PE program, uh, doing a lot of uh, work trying to improve your trunk lift isn't going to get you what you want and expect in your, in your academic achievement improvements. But, but working in these two areas uh, is going to help, as is in the push-ups. So, that was one thing we did, and here we broke it out by uh, grade level too. So it's uh, boys and girls reading, boys and girls math, and uh, this is still, I think, something we, we need to uh, pay attention to and learn a little bit more from. Again, it's cross-sectional, so we see very small you know, uh, reductions in boys reading uh, based on that high and low quintile sort of approach. Um, but that it, it grows into middle school. And it might be that there's so much growth going on in middle school and, and uh, everyone that knows it does work with kids knows that things are, are fairly stable in third and fourth grade. And then in fifth grade, everyone starts growing rapidly and then they're really growing fast through the rest of the time. But uh, clearly, you know, if you're a, a superintendent and you had limited resources, you might put your money into, into middle school. Uh, if you're having problems with your academic achievement scores. That's what this set of data would tell us. Um, so here's a, a study, uh, a, a rather large study um, from uh, Scandinavia where they had uh, a, a million men. And, and there they have uh, forced conscription into the military. 
uh, and they keep records and track them uh, countrywide. And they're looking at a cohort of you know, age 15, kids are there, uh, through age 54. Um, they're in the Swedish military conscription, and they, they took a number of uh, sophisticated uh, uh, intelligence tests uh, of these people, and they also had fitness testing of them too. So they were both able to look cross-sectionally and longitudinally, and they also was able to identify um, twin twins who are in military service. So they could look identical twins uh, and non-identical twins and separate, you know, the uh, genetic versus environmental factors that are related to this relationship. So it's, it's really one of the, the, the most efficient and, and well done studies with a large number of people in it. If you just look at one study, this is a really good one to help you understand. So here we're just seeing some of the relationships cross-sectionally amongst 18 year olds. So in global intelligence, we've got, uh, uh, they're just taking their, their own fitness score and dividing it up into nine different piles. So kids who are the most fit have the highest level of global intelligence between about 3.5 up to a little over 5. Um, they make a point, and I only showed one of these, that muscular strength uh, doesn't, it flattens out. So they're, they're not uh, saying that muscular strength is, is, is as related as um, cardiovascular fitness. They, they also found in their research that CV fitness, aerobic capacity, was the strongest predictor to cognitive function and, and well not cognitive function, but these measures of intelligence. So logical intelligence, verbal intelligence, um, there. Uh, same with uh, visuospatial intelligence and technical intelligence. So we, we see it amongst about a, a million young men in this country uh, this kind of relationship. It's not a huge relationship, but it is a easy to see relationship. It's dose response, as I said, and it's reasonably strong. So it's fitting in into our causal criteria that uh, I mentioned at the beginning of this talk. So here we just see it in a slightly different way, and this is uh, over time. So if you look at the kids when they're 15 years old and classify them into two, three different uh, uh, fitness, cardiovascular fitness categories, and then look at their, their uh, intelligence levels uh, when they're 18 years old over a three-year period, you can see that fitness uh, reasonably strongly predicts um, your abilities in these different areas. So we've got a, a longitudinal assessment now of things. And while you know we, we could spend a fair bit of time unpacking this study, probably a whole class period, and don't have time to do that. But it's still a, a reasonably good effect. We're seeing a dose response. We're seeing you know a, a, a fairly robust effect too in the strength of the association category, and that it's holding over time over a three-year period. Um, Here's a different study by uh, Davis in 2011, and I think it's a, it's a really good study because we're talking now about experimentally inducing uh, and trying to measure changes in uh, cognitive function. So here we're, we're looking at the exercise improved executive function and achievement alters brain activation in overweight kids. So they've got overweight kids, they're bringing them to an after school program, they're doing it for 13 weeks. Uh, they've got three different levels of uh, participation in exercise. High participation, I think that's about uh, 90 minutes of aerobic physical activity versus something around 45 minutes or less physical activity versus a control where they're just going to an after school program. And they're doing that for 13 weeks. So here we're classifying them into these three different conditions and then the post test where they, they adjust for all kinds of things that you would, would want to try and adjust for. But it's a randomized controlled trial and we're seeing you know, reasonably striking differences. And while they're, uh, they're in the dose response form of category, they're, they're significant. Um, maybe not the biggest effects in the world because they've stretched the scale out. But still, here we're seeing that we can experimentally induce in overweight kids Overweight kids are probably you know, leaning towards pre-diabetes anyway, so the health consequences are over here. We're seeing that we can improve things, and this is just one measure. They have uh, uh, um, neuroimaging studies too, which shows uh, you know, differences in co actual cognitive structure of the brain. So it's, it's a fairly interesting bit of experimental evidence. Remember the last criteria I talked about in our causal criteria. Um, this is a study that uh, I participated in uh, myself. It's under review and to be published soon. And uh, we took uh, eight Texas schools, and in four of those, we randomized them into, we paired them and randomized them into uh, a high 
physical activity school and a low physical activity school. And we asked the schools in the high physical activity schools to achieve 60 minutes per day of physical activity. And then the other schools just did what they normally did. And that turned out to be about 30 minutes of physical activity for the kids versus 60. And the way we did it by increasing the physical activity wasn't by stretching out the PE class, uh, although we tried to improve the quality in, of the PE so that it was more physically active. But we inserted in the morning and in the afternoon activity breaks that took place in the classroom for about 10 to 15 minutes. That's where we got the extra 30 minutes of physical activity. So in this case, this experiment is showing if you have classroom activity breaks, what do you get? So after the end of a, a year of doing this, uh, we, we, we saw you know, a reasonable effect of treatment versus control. Uh, it was bigger for girls than boys. And we had this at-risk score. Uh, and that risk was measured by a BASC scale, which is a standard uh, psychological assessment tool that schools use all the time, school counselors. Uh, and we see that you know, they were measuring levels of adaptability, social skills, leadership, study skills, and functional communication. There were 22% of the kids that fell into the at-risk category, so about one in, in four of the kids are, are at risk in this set of schools, and they're in this bar here. And uh, here, what we're seeing, and we measured the uh, Stanford Achievement Test, just like in that previous uh, set of slides from California I showed you, which is a, you know, a very highly you know, accepted test across the country of measures of uh, academic achievement. And we're seeing a, a 4.9%, which is about a 10% improvement. So now I can go to schools and say, if you do activity breaks in the morning, and do them in the afternoon, we've got the strength of association, we've got a dose response effect, um, we've got uh, biologic uh, plausibility and credibility, we've got experimental data with this and that previous study. Um, so we're starting to say, well, yes, I think you know, if, if a school superintendent does this, um, because they're doing all sorts of different things, that some of the things that we object to, that if you've been, uh, you've been through the system, you're all young enough, so if you remember the rote drilling in September leading up to the exam in uh, March, so that gets a little bit annoying. So there, there's all sorts of different ways to do it. I'd rather we do things which are scientifically empirically derived. So th this is a study which falls into that experimental category. So this is a slide I just show them. It's, it's time to pay more attention to physical activity and to do something about it in your school districts. And we're, we're getting there slowly but surely. Oops. Um, so why not in our schools here in Texas, why shouldn't we have PE every day? We know there's cognitive benefits for it. We know that the kids need the skills. They need the time to develop skills and to become physically fit. They need to learn the lifetime physical activity skills. And many of you, or many of you, might be teachers yourselves. So you know that uh, it's fun to teach. That the kids like to do it. The previous speaker from UIL said that's main, one of the main reasons kids stay in school. You know, my son loves physical activity. If he didn't have PE, he'd, he'd probably go out of his mind. He's one of those kids. Um, why not 60 minutes of physical activity at school? Why not, and this is a side note, you know, we do this fitness gram, but we don't send the parents home what their kids are, are scored on. Um, so I make the case for why, why shouldn't we do that? Why not implement activity breaks? You know, there's a little bit of resistance, and we did an experiment in the Austin Independent School Districts where it took us about three years. But over that three-year period, we got teachers to start accepting doing these physical activity breaks and you know all it, I mean we could do one right now they're pretty easy to do if you if you link them to to you know the math the math content or the history content or the reading content because you can be moving while you're learning. It's just a matter of being creative. We've developed hundreds of activities. So there's no reason not to do them except maybe that the teacher doesn't like moving themselves. Uh, and it's probably good for them too. Uh, so why not create opportunities outside of school for physical activity so that the majority of kids can participate? That This is a bit of a problem in high school as we get specialized, especially in the bigger schools. It's harder to get on the sports teams. So um, if you analyze, you know, this is the, the typical um, elementary school or middle school. If we start thinking, how are we going to do, how are we going to get to 60 minutes? Uh, you know, in elementary school, we were supposed to do 150 minutes per week, uh, which is 30 minutes per day, uh, and then 225 minutes every two weeks. Those are the standards of what you're trying to shoot for within PE. But there's plenty of other times to get physical activity during the day. There's active transportation at the beginning of the day and again at the end of school. And we've done research that says if you live about more than 15 minute walk or bike ride, you're, you're, you're not likely to walk to school. 
Uh, so probably the top end you could get for a portion of the kids, if you, if you figure out ways to make it safe, especially for younger kids, um, then parents might actually do it. Um, so you could get, you know, 15, you could get 30 minutes just, just walking to and from school. That's half of your 60 minutes. So you can conceive of it that way so that if you present it in this way uh, to an active PTA group or concerned parent group or, or, you know, teachers, they could probably figure out a way to make it more likely to be walking or biking to school just with bike racks and locks and things like that. Um, activity breaks in the morning and in the afternoon you know, at about 20 minutes. Um, Oh, I'm sorry, you can uh, open the gym in the morning. A lot of schools deal with discipline problems where uh, kids, they congregate in middle schools. You've been in the big urban middle schools where there's 1,000 know, kids, maybe 2,000 kids, and they all jam in the front courtyard or in the, uh, the big auditorium. And before you know it, they're pushing each other and all sorts of bad things are happening. We've experimented with just opening the gym, letting the kids by grade, sixth graders on Monday, uh, seventh graders on Tuesday, eighth graders on, on uh, Wednesday, and just rotate it through. It reduces discipline problems considerably. In the first morning, teachers report that the kids are a little more calm, a little more focused, and more ready to, to engage in the educational process simply by opening the gym. So if you walk to school and open the gym, you could be up to 30 minutes or more per day of physical activity. Um, then we've got the classroom activity breaks for about 15 minutes. And then PE itself, you might have a 40 minute period or a half hour period, but usually only half of that is any movement. The rest is instruction time on you know, gross motor skills and let's learn how to play the game, what's the rules of the game, let's refine the stuff of it. So you can only expect so much out of PE. And PE is not gonna get you to your 60 minutes. So many people in superintendents say, well, we got a good PE program. And that's great, but it's not going to get your 60 minutes. And the overweight kids probably need more like 90 minutes or 120 minutes anyway. Um, so there's after school, especially in urban areas again, there's many, many after school programs. And some of them last from three to five. So that's three hours of time. So I think I would submit that you, you should be able to get the kids active for at least you know, 40 minutes, 30, 40 minutes of that time after school. You'd, you'd hit a large percentage of the kids. And then there's, you know, after dinner. You know, in my neighborhood where we live, my son probably gets 120 minutes right in this category every day because he's out there playing with all the neighborhood kids. Not everyone lives in a neighborhood where that's possible. Um, and I go into the housing complexes in Houston and Dallas, and I have. Um, I wouldn't want my kid running around in there. So you have to figure out other ways. So that's why we have all these different systems in place. After school, it could be the intramural league too. So, so anyway, I think it's reasonable to say schools could take responsibility for a minimum of 60 minutes of physical activity per day. So I've started taking the epidemiology onto the road and I'm getting involved in advocacy and policy. So there's a local foundation in Austin called the RGK Foundation and they, they invited me to write a report where I summarized all the Texas law regarding uh, physical activity and all the interventions by those categories in the slide that I just showed you and put them in this report. Uh, right before the legislative session two years ago. And we got a little bit of legislative movement uh, with physical activity. Um, now I've written another one, uh, of which I have a few copies right here. And uh, I'll just briefly summarize for you the different uh, actions that uh, I recommend, which are uh, evidence-based strategies, best practice-based strategies. And uh, the, the goal was to figure out revenue-neutral policy solutions. So we all know that uh, this next legislative session and the last one, the state had a, a hard time uh, with funding of schools, and there's been reductions in funding that are causing misery out there to uh, school principals and such. Um, so that it's hard to say, give me another $25 million or $50 million for PE only, that's probably not going to happen. So I look for revenue neutral solutions, one of which is to aim, you know, just setting high expectations. Not many schools know or think that they should be responsible for 60 minutes. I think they should know that. I think we ought to write it right into the Texas Education Code. And here's uh, my recommendations for how to do that. You can find these reports, by the way, at the RGK website if you're interested. Second one is just do the brain activity breaks. There's, there's lots of them. Uh, two speakers ago in the morning, uh, there's a, the, the woman from uh, um, Virginia has hundreds of them by category available online. 
So if you look at the two, look, look at the online sessions here, and you'll see that you can just go and get them. The school doesn't have to spend any money. All they have to do is train their teachers and, and get them to deliver them. And I make note on the education code and the, the uh, essential knowledge and skills where you can make adjustments. I think it's time to codify some of this into our public policies, the things that the superintendent should be reading and paying attention to, and that school boards should be saying, here's the law, here's the code, why aren't we doing it? Um, that's the way you get things done in a really big way. Um, not to say the schools shouldn't do this anyway on their own, um, but that, that legal argument in the education code just, just tries to push it a little bit further along. Um, joint land use agreements. There's, there's a really good website which has all possible different land use agreements. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> public schools are public property. And uh, again, I'm talking mostly about the urban schools. Some of them are just leaving the, the, the facilities so that uh, no one can ever use them after school. If they're not being used for, sport, it's, for sports, there's no reason why you couldn't go and use that. It's like a public park or a basketball court inside. It's just a matter of trying to figure out the legal and insurance arguments. And uh, many school districts have moved forward to do that for they find partners on the outside like the YMCA or other organizations so that they can use the facilities. In some cases, in sophisticated cases, the schools can actually make money by renting their gymnasium to outside organizations or their playing fields. So it could be a revenue producer instead of a revenue loser. Uh, and that's what's inside of that website. Uh, transparency. I think, um, I think we should post the requirements in the schools so that parents have easy access to finding out what their school is responsible for. What does the state law say? So that parents can start asking the, the principal or the teacher, why aren't we doing what we're supposed to do? Uh, planning, uh, each school district has a school health advisory council. If, if they receive any funding and from federal USDA sources, if they have uh, free and reduced lunch, uh, funding which comes in to provide food for kids, um, they're required to have a district level school health advisory council and there's a state level one too. But there's no real guidance about how to compose that council and I'm suggesting that we, you know, modify this particular uh, section of the education code to say you must have a physical activity sub-council of this council. So you have a group, usually they're parents and teachers who meet periodically once per month or so, and they're the ones who will read what the state laws are and look at and compare to what the current practices are within the school. So you can let the parents know through notification in the gymnasium, but also having a site-based group of you know, concerned uh, individuals, uh, if you wrote that into the state law, then it, w then it would happen. And they could make their own local decisions uh, as they see fit. Um, and then I think, and this one is going to cost a little bit of money, it's uh, right now in middle schools at least, uh, the requirement is uh, four semesters out of six that physical education is required. I think we should make it five. You know, the, the gymnasium's there, the equipment's there. Um, if you can schedule it in, I think a lot of kids would be happy if they made it five. Um, the, the, the where this would be the downside is they might need to have more teachers' aides uh, and uh, it would cause trouble with the scheduling. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to that idea. But uh, some districts can do it and others will have a hard time with it. Uh, I think uh, that's a possibility we ought to consider. And then we'll get more physical activity, more training of the kids. Because really, by the time you're going to high school, if you're not an athlete, you don't get any more instruction time in physical activity. And that's a really good time to, to, to do it because your body's growing rapidly, especially the boys through puberty, and you're sort of losing uh, any exposure to training in physical activity that you could carry on in through your college and adult years. So just in summary, uh, if we look at this causal criteria, I think we have you know, a pretty good strength of association. It's anywhere in the 1.5 to 2 to 2.5 extra uh, protective benefit of physical activity. We see very strong dose response depending on different variables, different states, different times. Um, we see a consistency in the literature with the several meta-analysis and the, the CDC report. Uh, temporality, we don't have that many longitudinal studies or that many experimental studies. So we probably need to work a little bit harder in that area. And those studies are being conducted. So in a couple years from now, I'd probably put, you know, if they turn out the way I think, you know, four stars instead of two. Uh, biologic plausibility, I think we have actually a fair bit of biologic plausibility. 
Um, and then experimental, it's, ju it's just really on the beginning side. So again, a couple years. But I think you know, we're, we're moving towards a position where we can say that physical activity causes strengthening of the brain and causes uh, increases in uh, uh, academic achievement. And that's, that's, then we can use this information presented to the Department of Education here in Texas or federally or any other state and, and request that they take note of it and take action. So instead of you know, eliminating teachers, eliminating PE teachers or reducing the amount of time, I think we have to put it back into the curriculum. Um, so, there's a summary, I'm just about, uh, and I just want to let you know, uh, we are trying to get active in social media, if you like the things I'm saying, just uh, look for them here. And I'm going to end there and take any questions.